Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter dev chat in the how did you hear about us section. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode number 305 of The Freelancer Show. This week on our panel, we have Eric Dietrich. Hi, everybody. And Jeremy Green. Hey. And I'm Ruben Lerner. And this week, I, I call this, I'm not sure if this is the best description, but giving a good impression, a good first impression to, their, to your clients. And basically... You see a lot of questions online from people starting in freelancing, but even not so starting in freelancing, saying, look, what should I put on my website? What should I put on my business cards? So clients will notice me and be impressed, want to hire me. And that can be like you know, your GitHub account, your LinkedIn account, your Facebook page. Like today we have myriad of places where you can sort of hang out your shingle and make your impression. So we're going to try to talk this week about what you can do to make a great first impression and a continuing impression on your clients and where you should and should not perhaps put your effort. So I'm going to, I'm going to start with just by saying for years, for many, many years, I was doing like web development consulting. So like I was helping people put up their websites and their web applications and my website was pathetically bad. Like, <laughs> like up a paragraph or two of black on white text saying, Hi, this is what I do. Call me. And I was sort of amused and surprised that this didn't affect things too much. And this led me to reach the conclusion that in many cases, clients don't look at your website or potential clients don't look at your website. Am I totally daddy for saying something like that? I don't think so personally. I've, I've, uh, I've always had a site that was at least passingly presentable ever since I've been on my own, but I've heard a lot of similar kind of stories. And I can't really recall any anecdotes later where clients mentioned wanting to hire me for things because they thought that my website was great, especially because I was doing a lot of uh, management consulting and coaching type things. So it's probably not what they were looking for. So I don't think that's crazy at all, even you know if it is aligned, even if you're doing web design, because it might just give the impression that you're too busy to or, or have no need to even do inbound marketing. I, I would guess, and this is just a guess, that design maybe makes more sense. But even yeah. so, like, I'm not sure how many of my clients actually ever look at my website. Like, <laughs> I mean, I'll get a phone call from someone saying, oh, I heard about you from so-and-so. And then, like, in my case, I'm doing a lot of training, so they'll say, well, you know, we need a Python course. And I'll say, well, why don't you look at the syllabus on my website? Now, this, it, like, if you look at my website, it's really hard to miss nowadays. And it's very obvious then that they didn't look, meaning they didn't check it out, they didn't read it, and their impression is based on the recommendation and talking to me on the phone. So, so like the people who say, well, if I'm going to be a freelancer, I must spend time, effort, money on a really fancy website, I am far from convinced that's the case. Yep, I agree. I've been there as well, where in the business of offering websites to people and just had a really terrible one because never had time to really, you know, work on it. And, uh, it, it didn't seem to affect whether people would hire us. So a lot of what I'm doing these days is in the realm of SEO domain authority and content marketing. And I think thing, uh, something for listeners to bear in mind is that if you hang out your shingle and alongside of that, you put up a website, 
it's going to have very little domain authority, a.k.a. Google juice. So unless you specifically show it to people, people aren't arriving there. It's just not how, in the beginning, you're going to attract leads. So it's kind of up to you whether people see your website or not. Yeah. I mean, I, for historical reasons that I'm going to try to fix in the coming months, I have a separate website from a blog. Like they're, I mean, both of them are by Linux CLIL domain, but one is blog dot and one is like, not not that. Anyway, and so I tried to get myself noticed. Like I did try to make an impression to get myself noticed on my blog over time by posting content, but for a really long time, no one noticed it because you might not know this, dear listener, but the internet is a pretty big place. <laughs> and so if you're going to like post your content, it's not necessarily going to be picked up by people, even if it's brilliant. So I spent a lot of time sort of trying to figure out how to get exposure and some social media helped a bit, but the thing that really helped me to get exposure to technical folks and then coming to my site and taking a look and so forth, sorry, so my name was, was by posting, like hooking my blog up to these aggregation engines. So in the Python world, you have Planet Python. And most languages, I sort of looked into this uh, a few years ago, most languages and systems and frameworks have some sort of aggregator like that, which is an RSS combined. It's like a meta RSS feed. So instead of you having to go to all the different Python blogs and read them, or have your RSS reader read them, you go to this one RSS feed that collects from all of them. And I've definitely found that when I post something to my blog now, it gets exposed to a lot more people, and they then spread it around. And that adds to that SEO authority that Eric was talking about, um, to the degree that now, like much to my surprise, my blog is getting a, a large number of people each day, and you know, sort of ranks higher and higher in the rankings for certain words. So it takes time and a little bit of strategizing, but it's definitely possible. And I, I, I would say actually, even if you're gonna ignore the design of your website, the content can be a great way to get people in. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it, you've got this kind of tail from when you hang out your shingle until when you really start getting noticed that you have some control over. So you can start solving the problem of, I guess, pleasing those readers when they come in as they come in, giving them good content is key. And then, you know, maybe if people are bouncing from your site or if you're not getting the leads you want, that's when you can think about maybe making the site snazzier or creating some kind of better user experience. But getting the content out there is probably the first most important thing. Yeah. And one thing to, that's important to note on that is that that content should be aimed at your customers and not your peers. Uh, it's pretty easy to, to fall into the idea of I want to write articles that I want to read where that's not really going to be the most effective. I mean, it's not to say that it, it doesn't ever help and can't help, but it's just more effective if you're targeting the content that you are creating to your customers and not to people that are doing the same job that you're doing. Yeah, that is so true. And it, it kind of makes me think in the general theme of, of making a good first impression, too, that there are certain ways that people who have been employees all their lives are used to doing things. Uh, one of them, especially in the software development world, is really speaking to and trying to impress your peers. And if you are, say, a junior developer, I'll include a senior developer as a peer, because out in the world where you're dealing with buyers, those are kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're used to speaking to peers, and you're also used to appealing to people in a resume-oriented way, where they're going to do a deep dive into your skill set. And that's also not probably how you're going to make a good impression on your clients because they don't want to get to know all the intricate details of what you've done on GitHub. They want to know how you're going to help them. So focusing your content, your site, and, and your online presence uh, and kind of everything you do around that I think is very important. Yeah, so I have this weird situation where I have like two types of potential clients that I'm aiming to reach. Like One is, would be the, the training managers at companies because I want them to hire me to do training. But the other would be my my peers because they might sign up for my mailing list, buy my books, buy my courses, and so forth. Mm. And so I've basically convinced myself that I'm going to, on my blog, aim to get to my peers so they'll get on my mailing list and buy things. Also so that like a lot of times training comes through not to the training manager, but through someone on the team who saw me at a conference or heard or whatever. And so this gives me like, you know, authority with them and they'll say, oh yeah, we should talk to this guy just in case. Like maybe the training manager will say to them, well, what do you think of this guy? But the only thing that's like really messed with the training managers are the syllabi, which my peers could not care 
less about. And I'm actually thinking of redoing my website so that like when you come in, it says, hey, are you a and then lead them to the stuff that's most likely to interest them. And I realize it's a very hard thing to do well, and I will probably do it mediocrely <laughs> at first, <laughs> as well as invent the word mediocrely. I like it. I'm curious, how much of the business that comes in for you is, uh, and that's a good point, by the way, about I was sort of speaking as if everyone were doing what I'm doing and talking to consulting for firms uh, about consulting work. But if you are legitimately marketing towards your peers, then it makes sense to to make a good impression on them. How much of your business, Reuven, comes from developers going to their managers and enlisting them to bring you in versus marketing directly to those managers? It's hard for me to know for sure, and I'm trying to like get a handle on that. I would say most of it, though. Like, it, it's uh, when a training manager contacts me out of the blue from a company, it's usually because someone on their technical staff said, "We need a course in Python." I heard from my peers at such and such a company, you know, other company, competitor, my previous company, that we should call this Ruben guy. And so then the training manager calls me. Often, like, with just an email address and a phone number and not much more, they haven't even checked out my website. So mm-hmm. they are not necessarily interested in the content. Whereas, um, look, I know there's one company that I did a course for like three years ago, and two of their people um, signed up for my mailing list. And I'm positive that when they called me back in about three months ago, um, I mean, I spoke with one of the people who I know is on my list, and I'm 100% sure that it's because he kept getting these weekly reminders of who I am and what I do. He was like, yeah, he still does training. We should call him. Hmm. Now, by the way, it, it might very well be that I should be marketing more to the training managers. And I'm, I'm still trying to figure out like how to get into some newer, bigger clients. And that is a thought. Like market to them and say, hey, don't you want courses like this? But I haven't had much success doing that so far. And I've got to really think about how to do it. So in the vein of making a good first impression, when those managers do call you up based on that referral, how do you hit it off well with them? So the fact that I could say them, if you, first of all, like the fact that I can sort of talk fluently about what I'm offering is definitely useful. The fact that I can tell them where I've worked is useful. But then when they say, well, what are you offering your course? The fact that I can point them to my site and have syllabi there, that like is fantastic. Because it means it's not just a one-off. You know, these are products I've been working on for years. They see there are a whole bunch of courses there. And so letting them know that, oh, yeah, I don't just do a little bit of training. Like, this is what I do. And you can see proof of that on my site, which I clearly didn't set up just while we were on the phone. I think that is, like, very useful and convincing. So even if they don't, like, stumble across that part of my site themselves, being able to point them to it or just send them a URL and uh, the email is, I think, very useful. Sure. So the the preparation and the impression that you well, the accurate impression that you've done this for, I'm trying to extrapolate to my own experience and broader themes, and that is very true. Uh, like with our content business, there's the same kind of thing going on. You can see that we didn't just throw this together, and for the content business, we can point to you know my name and some of our authors' names as bylines on other websites, and that's the kind of preparation you can't fake. Mm-hmm. So that's powerful, certainly. So what what else can we have? Like so so even if like I, I guess we've come full circle to some degree, which is oh don't worry about your website. Oh, but it should like so I think we mostly meant like <laughs> don't worry about making it super fancy, but right. the content should be aimed at like the people you're trying to sell to and convince them. What what else could or should you have on there that would make people go wow I I want to I want to work with this person. If you I think if you can get them test oh sorry go ahead. Oh, yeah. I, I was going to say, I think the same thing. If you have previous work that you can point to, you know, having a portfolio of work is good. And then testimonials that from people that you have done work for uh, are really good and can be very convincing. Yeah, I agree. And um, if, for those of you new to hanging out your shingle, you can probably get creative, um, depending on the particulars of getting testimonials from past bosses and other people, even peers that will speak well to your work. It doesn't need to be a complete tabula rasa when you go off on your own. You can kind of leverage what you've done before and explain during sales conversations, well, you know, I was doing this for organizations, but because I got so good at it, now I'm doing it on my own. Absolutely. So what other than your website 
would be a good place to, I mean, so I, I saw someone mention online, uh, like GitHub. I mean, I guess it's obviously more for developers. I have a pretty pathetic GitHub account. Like I've had it, I have proven as my username because like I was one of the first people to sign up. Okay, also this is my username. Like my, my name is kind of unusual, but <laughs> that, that helps. But for someone who's been using GitHub more or less since it started, someone would go to my, my account and say, really? That, that's all you've done? Are you kidding me? So it wouldn't really help me, but I do get the impression that a lot of companies, a lot of potential clients, especially if they're technical, do want to see a lot there. What, what do you guys think? I'm kind of torn on this. The My gut is to say, if you're sending people to GitHub and they're doing what amounts to picking through your repos and kind of reviewing your code, that's an arrangement that starts to look a lot like pseudo-employment to me. So uh, I don't know that there's anything wrong with having a GitHub repos, uh, obviously, or a body of work out there. But I think I would want to be framing and steering those discussions uh, with potential clients away from a detailed examination of that. You know, maybe something that occurs to me is that you could even invest a little bit in a uh, an enterprise account and say that you have, you know, proprietary work product. And so you've, you know, you're showing contributions to the site. You have an account, but, you know, this is my secret sauce. I know what I'm doing. Let's talk about your needs. I hadn't even thought of that. That the moment that you put out a repo there or repos, people look at the code, they're seeing it as like, Staff augmentation, let's hire someone who's a contractor rather than an employee, but still treat like an employee because they're looking through your code. They're not asking you to solve the problems. Wow, that's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah, that would be my hesitation. I mean, it's, so if I'm, I'm thinking of somebody who's newly looking to do kind of either contract software development work or pure consulting or something, if you go out and put a lot of energy into making yourself look impressive on GitHub, that would be my worry personally, is that it kind of puts you into the hiring mill, so to speak. Yeah, I think that's largely true, but not, maybe not always true. Uh, I think there are certainly people out there that have developed very healthy consulting businesses based on the strength of their open source contributions. You know, I don't even know if he does it anymore, but I know that for a while Mike Parham was doing a good bit of consulting around Sidekick and, you know, background work and all that kind of stuff that he largely developed due to his Sidekick work. Uh, Pete Keen has done a good amount of consulting around payment processing for apps based on his work uh, on the Payola gem. I think that can work, but I think you have to kind of be mindful about cultivating the right set of repos to, to make that happen. You know, you, you, right. the, both of those guys really specialized and wrote software around what they were specializing in, not just, you know, random contributions to a bunch of open source projects. Yeah. So I wonder how you walk the line of my repos and my online presence demonstrates that I'm an expert you should call and defer to versus here's a bunch of code, evaluate how good I am at programming. Uh, I don't have an answer to that off the top, but clearly since people have success doing that, there is an answer. Well, if you're, I, I think for the people who do these sorts of open source projects and then turn into businesses, that is a great advertisement, right? Because they can see your code and, and they're hiring you for your technical expertise and prowess in this very specific field, right? So I could go in and modify open source library, ABCD, and then use it on my own in my company, or I could just configure and use it. But I'm just going to hire the expert because they wrote the darn thing and look at all the amazing things they've done and look at how responsive they are. Like you can really build a, a very strong image of yourself, um, how possible it is to be doing that sort of open source sort of consulting value adding consulting is another question, but I think it, it, that can be convincing. But if it's just like, look at all this software that I've written, Hey, look through my code. I, I, I think I agree. I, I would be hesitant and or skeptical, but that's really going to convince people. And I don't know how many people are going to really look through it anyway. I mean, it's like going through a job interview <laughs> as a consultant. Oh my God. Like, that would be <laughs> nightmarish. <laughs> yeah. So maybe it's, if, maybe it's in how you're explaining your contributions to people when you talk to them, because there are certainly a lot of people on counter out there that say, you know, you can go look at my source code online and you ought to hire me because I'm good at this or I can help you with legacy code or I write clean code. And I think that's kind of inviting a granular 
examination interview style versus <clears throat> I put up this repo that's free to you and it can help you do X, Y, and Z. That seems a lot more likely to get calls about consultative expertise depending on what's in that repo. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Kind of related to GitHub, I think that there's possibility to possibility to kind of build and demonstrate expertise by answering like Stack Overflow questions or those types of sites, you know, where communities are. And again, that, you know, that's one where you kind of have to watch out because you're in a lot of cases going to be talking to your peers. And so if that's if your peers are not your customers, it might not be as effective as if you know, for someone like you, Reuven, uh, where your peers are your customers, uh, you know, I could see answering Python questions on Stack Overflow being a reasonable way for you to get on people's radar as a guy who knows a lot of stuff about Python. But I've had a few, you know, inbound leads come in just for, based on having answered Stack Overflow questions before. And it's always wow. nice when that happens. Were, so if you're doing this, was it very, are you answering kind of like very specific and narrowly focused questions? I'm just kind of curious uh, what that inbound lead looked like. Yeah. So for a while when I was learning Ember, uh, one of the kind of tricks that I used to try to learn more about it was just intentionally every day answer several questions on Stack Overflow about Ember. So they were all, you know, around just the one technology and I was doing it you know, several questions a day, every day for months, just in as part of my learning. And then as a side effect of that, I started seeing some leads come in where people were saying, hey, we saw several of your answers on Stack Overflow and we're looking for help finishing this project or starting this project or whatever. And so they were, you know, I, I think a lot of them probably would have been closer to what you described earlier, Eric, as not exactly employment, but closer to it than consulting work, you know, mm -hmm. but if, if that's the kind of, you know, there are plenty of freelance contractors that aren't exactly consultants. Uh, so if that's the kind of thing that you're doing, you know, it can be useful for that. When that happened, were they perceiving you as the expert in that framework? Or were you, were they calling you in to be the Ember expert? Yeah. Got it. Yeah. I think that's powerful. So that's, maybe a good blueprint for success because wh whatever the particulars of any one engagement, whether it's contractual or consulting or both, I think that that's a viable strategy where you kind of gobble up maybe one particular category, which makes you viewed as an expert and could lead to all sorts of leads. I think for me, the big thing would be to be called as an, in as an expert rather than a resource. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. let, let me ask you about Stack Overflow. Uh, I think mostly Jeremy. I, so I was around when Stack Overflow started. I was around when the sense, it seems like the universe was created the way I'm talking today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but basically, like, I never really got into it. I mean, obviously, I go there. Google takes me there all the time. Yeah. And I go there for answers. Like, it's really quite impressive to see what they've built. And I guess it was like a year or two ago. I said, you know what? I'm going to try to answer some questions there. Not even as a, uh, like a matter of getting a lot of points and credibility there, but just as a, a way to like help other people. Mm -hmm. And I found that answering questions as a newcomer is really hard because the questions are scooped up so quickly and answered so quickly. And most of, and, and if you're new, then you're restricted in sort of how much you can write mm -hmm. and yeah. what you can edit. And it seemed like the threshold back in the olden days was way lower than it is now. Yeah, that may be true. I do remember at the beginning, yeah, I don't remember what the restrictions are. Like you can only comment you can't answer at first which is kind of weird but yeah I, I do remember there being kind of a hump that i had to get over of leaving so many hmm. comments or or whatever I, I don't remember the particulars but you're right that there is a little bit of a barrier to entry on that yeah i'm trying to remember too i remember it being fairly short-lived but i was probably last answering a lot of questions maybe seven years ago and i built up enough of a score that it's a pretty seamless experience for me when I go there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it might be that you, if to... you want to go that route, there's a burn that you have to f make a concerted effort to fight through. I honestly don't recall. Okay, that makes sense. And I'm, I'm sure that's partly on purpose. Right? They've, they've, I must say, Stack Overflow is very cleverly designed. I remember seeing a talk by Joel Spolsky years ago about how they put together the sort of ensure 
best answers, best community, and there were a lot of things that they could have done that they actively did not just because they wanted to encourage people to have certain behavior. So mm-hmm. that, this, this might be one of those that I just sort of have gotten caught up in. Huh. So where else, like, or where else or what else could people do to give their clients a, a good impression? I would say this is like a, a, an old callback of mine, speaking at conferences and user group meetings. These, these meetings are always desperate for someone to come in and give a talk. Maybe it's not this month, the next month. And it doesn't have to be super formal, doesn't have to be super brilliant, but if you get up in front of people and you talk about a subject, you are instantly tagged as an expert on that subject. And, and by the way, here's a, here's a little pro tip, folks. Don't get up in front of everyone and say, well, I really don't know much about this, so I really hope you'll enjoy my talk. But I, I learned a lot, and uh, yeah, yeah. So let's talk about uh, variables, right? Yeah, yeah variables. Right? Yeah. Don't do that. But if, if you're a little more confident than that, you'll be fine. And people will be like, oh, that's really interesting. And over time, you'll gain a reputation of someone who knows about whatever subject you're talking on. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I, so I've done some speaking here and there over the years, but blogging is a lot more in my background. And I had an experience that really echoes that, where at some point I just started offering my opinion and blogging and people started following me. And I don't know exactly when it happened, but I started to be viewed as an expert in some subjects, which, you know, came as a surprise to me. I mean, I thought, well, yeah, I know some stuff about this, but you guys are acting like an authority. I'm an authority. And then I realized, I guess, after enough showing up, whether it's speaking, writing, whatever you're doing, people do view you as an authority. And that's kind of legitimate because when you're showing up enough, you're reading about this, you're coming to understand it, you're learning how to teach it. And before you know it, you can speak authoritatively. So, yeah, absolutely getting out there, speaking, writing, just showing up and practicing, um, you get that confidence. How, how should you, like, so if you're just in speaking places, like, how should you find the right place to go um, or the right people to talk to or the right group or the right conference. That's hard, I think, because it probably really depends on what you're selling and to whom. Like for me, with a lot of, say, the management strategy consulting I was doing, if there were going to be a conference that I would go to and want to be noticed at, it would be something like, a, you know, a executive leadership kind of conference, like a CIO conference or something like that, uh, which wasn't actually a marketing strategy for me. But, you know, for what you're doing, Ruben, you know, Python conferences, I imagine, uh, are an excellent source of inbound leads. So I, I think it's probably case by case to a large extent. Yeah. I mean, I, I spoke a few months ago with the training manager, one of my clients, and I asked her that, you know, I, I do some uh, coaching for trainers. And I said, so people are asking me, like, where should they go to get you information? She said, go to training conferences. And it was like such an obvious thing to discover, oh, of course there are conferences for people who do, like not who give the training, but the managers and the whole like training industry, their organizations, they have conferences. If you go there, you basically have a room full of people looking for those doing trainings. And that's a clear example of you go where your clients are, not where your peers are. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's probably the the biggest piece of advice I'd give for that is kind of nose around and figure out what sorts of conferences your buyers attend and then see if you can get in to speak or do a lightning talk or something there. I would also suggest like, so it was last year or a year and a half ago. I mean, I go to China a few times a year, as people listeners probably know. And so I contacted the Beijing Python Users Group and I said, hey, I'm going to be in town when you're having a meeting. Would you be interested in having me give a talk? And they were like, yeah, sure. I mean, people, if you're coming from out of town, it doesn't have to be as like exotic as China. But if you're just going somewhere, maybe for a business trip or if you have, like a family that's willing to forgive you for doing work on vacation, which is probably a bad thing, but we can talk about that another time. But like, it, it's definitely worth trying and getting in touch with these places because again, they're often interesting speakers and someone from out of town, hey, if someone knew, they don't know, why not? Give it a shot. And indeed, following this advice. Just last week, I contacted people in Beijing and Shanghai, which are going to be there next month, and um, looks like I'm going to be giving a talk or two. So I'm, I'm pretty psyched. Yeah, there's also, I think, in there the human element of, uh, the human psychology element of scarcity, I guess. And if you're calling up and saying, or writing in and saying, yeah, I'm going to be in town for only about three days. It overlaps with what you're doing. What do you think about me coming there? I think, you know, the human nature is to say, oh, we should do that while we can. And it actually makes me think in general of um, 
uh, kind of a piece of advice that I'd offer to people when it comes to making an impression, maybe in a sales or pre-sales type of call, is whether this is true of you or not, you probably want to do your best to create the impression that you don't necessarily need this business. Not that you don't want it, but that you don't need it, that you're not desperate. You have a certain set of standards, you have a way of doing things, and you don't really deviate from that because uh, it's the best for the client, it's the best for you. If you have that kind of confidence, I think that that's powerful for giving them a good impression as well. Yeah, I, absolutely. And kind of related to that, once you're you know, moving through the, the prospecting stage with a prospect, make, making sure that you're qualifying them and asking them you know, making it clear that you're trying to establish, do I want to work with you helps as well. You know, it's, it just establishes authority a lot more than if you're treating it as, oh, please hire me. You know, I, I'm, I'm here ready to work for whatever you you want, you know, making it clear that it's both, both parties are agreeing to work with each other uh, helps establish some of that. Yeah, most definitely. I think maybe in the corporate world, you have this, this, wisdom you hear that like says the job interview is just as much about the company interviewing you and you interviewing the company but that's kind of it's almost tongue in cheek like people don't typically really believe that unless they're super confident but once you've hung out your shingle once you're out there that's literally true and it has to be true for the sake of your sanity and your business and and doing things efficiently um so even if you don't have the business lined up even if you don't feel confident projecting that confidence creates a good impression and i think You'd be surprised maybe at times how well pushing back goes. It establishes some boundaries in the buyer's mind and they, you know, respect that confidence. I don't think it hurts chances the way that newbies might think it does if you kind of push back on them at times. I think another thing that helps make a good impression is if your buyers are targeted enough. If you're positioned well and have a targeted set of buyers, you know, speaking their language and dressing the way they dress and just, you know, being able to be seen as kind of an insider of that group can help a lot. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Right. Well, this that's also like comes down to you know positioning and being specific. Because if you're trying to be all things all people, it's not going to quite match up with any of them. But if you're saying, "Oh, I, I'm in your camp," or "I know," you can use sort of the, the terminology they use mm-hmm. and understand the pain points that they're going to discuss much more easily, and they they will notice that. Yeah. Speaking their language, understanding their pain just struck something in my mind where when you do those things, it leads to these moments in certain sales conversations where you kind of seem psychic to them. Like in the uh, strategy and, and management consulting that I was doing, for instance, I can recall times where you know, a potential buyer, somebody who is an executive was talking about implementing a certain kind of policy. And just as a hypothetical, I might say, oh, you know, I bet I bet you did that. And in, in certain sections of the business, it seemed to go well. But then you had attrition in this group over here when you did that. And if you would correctly call something like that, they'll kind of blink at you. And then they become a lot more likely to be a buyer when when you're so in tune with how they speak and what their pain points are that you can predict what they've tried and how it turned out. That is uh, pretty powerful stuff. Absolutely. So what else can we do to uh, impress our, our clients? Oh, here, I'll, I'll, I'll tell a quick anecdote. So um, in uh, 1995, I was about to move to Israel from New York. And I was planning to start consulting, but I've really never done it before. But I, I had a, basically my employer said, well, when you get to Israel, we'll, we'll hire you as a consultant. So I knew I had like work at least from one place for a little while. And uh, I was living with my parents at the time. And they said, oh, you're going to be doing consulting. So you're really going to need a suit. And I said, well, I'm going to be consulting in computers from home <laughs> in Israel, like, that combination means, no, I will not need a suit. Um, <laughs> and, and indeed, um, I think my children saw that I had like a tie in my underwear drawer at some point. They were like, really? When did you last wear that? The answer was, <laughs> when I got married. <laughs> the, joy, the joys of the high-tech life in the Middle Eastern uh, um, dress code. The thing is, like, there are places where... The dress is something that people will pay attention to. I would say in high tech, it's less likely, but you can be sure that I actually dress up a little more when I'm dealing with clients in Europe and the U.S. and Asia than when I'm in Israel, where like people in Israel just tend to dress down. Like 
we're lucky people are going to work naked here, let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that might be something you might want to consider a little bit. Like, and if you're like me and you're a programmer who looks a little slumpy quite a bit, then like go one level up from what you might normally think about as reasonable and your clients might care. No one's ever said anything to me, but I'd like to think that you know, I've been putting in some effort there. Yeah, in doing a lot of consulting in enterprises, one rule of thumb that I typically had was to dress the way that my buyer dressed. Hard to go wrong when you do that. So you find out about the dress code in advance and you show up kind of looking like them. In more recent years, I've relaxed that a little bit and just kind of shown up in what I can get away with. And that might sound a little sloppy, but it actually creates an interesting dynamic where it's kind of a subtle manifestation of, I don't necessarily need this business. So if they're calling me up unprompted, asking me for my help, I won't go in, you know, in a way that would get them in trouble or anything, but I'm not overly worried about dress to impress. So there are signals that are sent there. I think the main thing is you want to make your buyer feel comfortable and you don't want to make the buyer feel uncomfortable by, you know, way underdressing and being embarrassing or something. But yeah, when in doubt, it probably doesn't hurt to go dressier than you otherwise might. That's not probably going to create a bad impression. Anything else? What, what else can we do? Uh, yeah. So, so once you actually get to the proposal stage, I think uh, something that you can do that can help set you apart from other people that might be submitting proposals is to include in the proposal a restatement of the problem and the desired state of things after the solution has been put in place. I see a lot of proposals from people, and I've done it, I had done it for years, uh, that the proposal just goes directly to the, the very specific details, you know, the tech, the list of tech specs, basically, of here's what we're going to do and here's what it's going to cost. And not that you can't include that in a proposal, but for a lot of buyers, they don't care about that. They want to know that their problems are going to be taken care of. And stating, restating the problem and then stating how you plan to improve the situation can really set you apart in that it shows that you're focused on solving the problem for the buyer, not just selling them a list of services. Yeah, definitely. I've found that I've had a lot of luck when I can sort of demonstrate that I'm not just executing a sequence of tasks or something. When when you're having that conversation about uh, value up front and, and it's clear to them that you've got their goals in mind, you understand what they're trying to do. I think that's a great point. Anything else, guys? Anything else you think of? I think we covered a lot of stuff here. Um, oh, oh, I know. I know we've discussed this in greater depth on other episodes, but LinkedIn profile. Mm. Or, 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 or I love to start with LinkedIn and we can talk about other social media as necessary. I actually did when I decided to focus on training. I actually did go through my LinkedIn profile. I made sure that it talked about training and training and training and training. Um, and like really focused on that. And I definitely found I'm sure I'm not the only person who does this who looks to see who's been looking at my profile. So I've seen you, you listeners out there. Anyway, um, <laughs> So it's it's not unusual for me to see that someone's been looking at my profile from a company that like could be a client, and then two days later to get a call from that person, mm. and I, then of course there's there's the question of well do I say oh I know exactly who you are because I've been stalking you, or um, oh it's so nice to meet you really where are you from mm -hmm, very interesting I usually go for number two. <laughs> anyway, so I definitely found that sort of accentuating what you're interested in doing and what clear benefits you can bring to clients, that's what people are looking for. And so don't say, I'm an expert in such and such software or such and such technology. Say, I help businesses to do X and Y and Z through my expertise of such and such software. And it might not seem like a big deal to you, but it will be a big deal to the people who are looking through tens of profiles on LinkedIn trying to figure out who they should call. Yeah, that's a great point. I think of the who and do what statement. I, f I think it's from Book Yourself Solid, among other places. Uh, I help who do what. If that's in your like little LinkedIn byline there, um, that can be really powerful. And so, Reuben, do you pay for that? I'm trying to remember how you get the ability to see who's been viewing your profile. You can pay. There was a short period of time. So I actually pay for it. I think I might have just gone on their I might pay for like a month or two because people suggested that I could use their 
their like um, navigator to find the sales navigator, I think they call it, to find potential clients to reach out to. So during that time, when you're paying, you can see like everyone who's looking at your site, uh, your profile. The free tier, which I've been on virtually all of my time on LinkedIn, the free tier lets you see, I think it's like five people of the last 20 who look at your profile. So it's far from perfect, but it's, you know, it can be interesting. I mean, I don't think it's worth it, at least not for me, to sign up, like to pay LinkedIn money just so I can see you look at my profile. But there are uh, people who are using, like, trying to reach it, use it for reaching out. And I've heard people do that. And I'm still trying to figure out how, if that's a good way for me to go, then it might be worth uh, paying. And it'll be just a side benefit. Yeah, I think it's pretty expensive, I want to say. I don't remember what the cost is. I don't remember. I think it was like $10, $20 a month, something like that, which, oh. again, if you get to drive sales, then huh. great. If you're using it to stalk people, not so great. <laughs> oh, you know, I might be thinking of advertising on LinkedIn as the expensive thing. I have to oh, check I that tried out. that, and it was... It was equally it was equally expensive and ineffective, so that was a winning combination. <laughs> <laughs> what, what about other social media? Like, I use Facebook for my personal stuff, basically, but I also cross post my blog post there just because why the heck not? But I don't really, and I guess I use Facebook like I have the, the trainer discussion group there, but I don't really see it as like a main place for me to like have a, a professional. Page like I think I set up a company page at some point because I was thinking of advertising because Facebook sort of forced me to do so. But it definitely wasn't like a, a main thought of mine. Well, any any thoughts about that? I have Facebook pages and I've created a Facebook group for a book that I launched, and I think you can get some mileage out of those things, even you know if you're a solo consultant or a contractor. But it's a lot of work. Like, I think the biggest thing now might be like creating groups and, and trying to create a community and some authority and a source of leads. But like, that's a pretty serious effort. So, uh, personally, my take would be to deprioritize Facebook as compared to LinkedIn. Uh, certainly, the cross posting of things you write to your blog to any social media you're on is, is a good move. But I personally probably wouldn't put a ton of effort into Facebook business depending, I guess. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, you do any uh, business stuff on Facebook? No, I, I haven't used it at all for business. I do use it for advertising. I've actually found, I mean, there's a little bit of a slide here, but I did some advertising for weekly price and exercise last year via Facebook and it was really effective. So I'm, I'm going to be doing that again for a new cohort in like two months. And I, I'm definitely like thinking of Facebook as a prime place to get people. That's just because you have, as we now know, incredible amounts of information that you can sort through and micro-target those communities. So like from the advertiser's perspective, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, I have a little experience with it myself, um, doing some retargeting for the book that I launched a little over a year ago. And uh, what I found was that it was quite effective for sort of short bursts of time. So if every few weeks I ran it for a few days, it would have great results and then diminishing returns. But I think, I guess, depending on what you're selling, I, I do know there are a lot of success stories with Facebook adv advertising if you have a, a pixel on your site. You know, the declining returns, I, I definitely saw those. And right, and I think partly it's because if you advertise to a limited group, then they're just going to see it again and again and be like, okay, enough. Yeah. <laughs> I'm tired of seeing this. <laughs> All right. Any other thoughts before we hand to picks? I think, you know, in closing for me, uh, one thing that kind of summarizes probably a lot of what we've talked about, or at least underpins it, is just, you know, having confidence. And I know that can be hard at first, but work does come even if you don't believe it in you know the first month or something, you will get gigs and things will happen. So if you kind of maintain that confidence in your expertise and in the way you can help people, um, that's going to really help create favorable impressions across the board. Absolutely. Yep, I agree. All right. Eric, you got any big press this week? Uh, I do. I think I'll throw, since I had mentioned it in passing, about the who and do what statement, uh, I will pick uh, Book Yourself Solid. I listened to it on audiobook maybe a year ago, and it's got you know tips in there for finding business. So that's probably something worth checking out if you're a freelancer. And then the other thing is I'm going to pick Microsoft Azure or Azure, however you say this. 
for my content business, I'm doing some internal automation and I have need to share it with a VA that we've hired. So I was looking for a quick way to take this little toy web app I'd built and put it into the cloud. And I was up and running in about three hours with, you know, uh, deployment and a database and, and the whole nine yards. So I was pretty impressed with uh, how easy it was to get going in that service. This was a, a .NET project, so there is that. But I found it pretty impressive, sure. and that's all I've got. Excellent, Jeremy. What you got? Uh, I'm I got uh, increaseyourconsultingfees.com, uh, which will direct you to a an email course about uh, delivering value to clients, which is closely related to what we've been talking about. Um, Part of some of the things that it focuses on are some of the t same types of things that we've been talking about today, where you uh, can really just try to make a, a good impression on them, which helps helps them see the value that you're bringing to them. Excellent. So I am almost done reading a book that I really want to recommend. Uh, it's, it's equal parts fasting and disturbing. The title is "Can Democracy Survive Global Capitalism?" and it's <laughs> <laughs> you can see it as tragedy or comedy, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's it's definitely one of the more sort of disturbing books that I've read lately. But also has really really made me think a lot about politics, economics, the world we live in. And even if I don't agree with everything that the author is raising, I think he raises a, a lot of very very interesting points. And if you're not interested in reading the books, you know, who reads books nowadays? I'll also put in the show notes a link to a talk he gave. So you can get sort of the, the gist of what uh, what he's talking about. Uh, Robert Kuttner, who's a professor of Brandeis and has written a whole bunch of stuff on politics and economics over the years. So I definitely recommend it, even if you're going to say, oh, that's ridiculous. I, I find it to be, as I said, really, really, really interesting. I've been sort of turning through the thoughts um, in my mind as I've been reading the book and trying to figure out sort of what, what to do with them. And on that happy note about the destruction of world capitalism, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everyone, uh, for listening. All right, Jeremy, thanks as usual. See you and next time. We'll be, back. Yeah, we'll be back next week on The Freelancer Show. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.